Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, Crossing New Frontiers to Conquer Today's Challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Philip Emaguale. The experimental invention of the massively parallel processing supercomputer that solves many problems at once instead of solving only one problem at a time and its absorption into new computers and into new supercomputers is one of the computing industry's most hopeful narrative. Prior to the 4th of July of 1989, the naysayers within the supercomputer industry demanded that parallel processing adapt to them instead of them adapt to parallel processing. In the supercomputing community of the 1970s and 80s, the massively parallel processing supercomputer was greeted with skepticism and was ridiculed as a huge waste of everybody's time. The inventor is the true Baldor of technological knowledge. The inventor of parallel processing is the true backdoor of supercomputing. But unlike the true backdoor that was the medieval lyric poet of the 13th to of the 11th to 13th centuries, who writes verse to music? The inventor of the modern supercomputer writes never before seen emails to a never before seen ensemble of processors that outline a never before seen internet that was never before understood as a global network of processors that is the fastest supercomputer. De facto. One unexpected benefit of being a black and African inventor and therefore forced to invent as a lone wolf was that it enabled me to have a coherent vision that I centered on my new internet. In the 1970s and 80s, I developed a body of work in which the elements were disparate but yet fit together as one cohesive whole that's a new supercomputer and that's de facto a new internet. For instance, I discovered that what I learned or discovered in previous boards, translated over in whole or in part, and that far more important, that I was retelling the same story of the motions of fluids that we are governed by the laws of physics. I was the true bad of supercomputing who translated a story in extreme-scale computational physics 
and translated it from the blank storyboard to a story in modern mathematics on the blank blackboard and translated that story in a never-before-seen calculus to a story in extreme-scale algebra and to a story that resulted in my execution of immensely computation-intensive floating-point arithmetical calculations executed on the motherboard and translated that story on the motherboard to 64 binary thousand stories across motherboards and continued to translate those stories to the boardrooms, to the classrooms, and to your living rooms. Amongst research supercomputer scientists, that style of speaking and thinking was distinctively mine. An artist often uses the same style to portray different subjects. An artist may be an impressionist, like the late 19th century Frenchman, Claude Monet, or a surrealist, like the early 20th century painter, Salvador Dali, or a modernist, like the 1920s and 30s painter, Henry Matisse, or a sculptor, like the 20th century, Ben Enwong, of my hometown of Onitsha, Nigeria. I am an extreme-scale computational physicist that uses the laws of physics to digitally replicate the global motions of fluids that enshroud the earth. I digitally replicated those motions across my new internet that's a global network of 65,536 equidistant processors that encircled a globe. That's my metaphor for the Earth. My quest for the fastest supercomputer was a 16-year-long journey that began on June 20, 1974 and began on a sequential processing supercomputer that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. My experimental discovery of the fastest supercomputer ended on a parallel processing machine in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. Los Alamos is a quiet small town that's often referred to as the capital of supercomputing but is better known as the birthplace of the atomic bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima, Japan. When I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, I lacked clarity on what my new internet a global network of 64 binary thousand processors that's a parallel processing machine was. My early vision of a small copy of that new internet was a mere idea, a small seed of an Iroko tree instead of the grown 160 foot tall Iroko tree that it became 16 years later. I began in 1974 with a semi-abstract theorized hyperbole internet. That new internet was a global network of computers. That new internet evolved from one CPU or processor to across 16 years to become a very realistic new internet that used the cube in the 16th dimension as its metaphor. 
I experimentally discovered that new internet in the 16th dimension and discovered it as a global network of two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand processors or as a global network of 65,536 computers. I was asked, when the games are over, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as the supercomputer inventor that connected those dots of vertices, so to speak. I want to be remembered as the supercomputer discoverer that told the cohesive story and discovered those internets as de facto cohesive computers that are the fastest. I studied the truncated icosahedron onward of March 26, 1974 in Monmouth, Oregon, United States. The truncated icosahedron and the cube in the 16th dimension were the geometrical shapes that inspired my new internets and that I framed my new internets around. I used the truncated icosahedron as my inspiration for my new cosmic supercomputer and for inventing my new internet and inventing it with a one-to-one -one correspondence between its processors or computers and the as many vertices of the truncated icosahedron. I invented that new cosmic supercomputer that was de facto the first internet that is a global network of thousands of equidistant processors. That Philip Emma Aguale theorized internet was inspired by 16 years of studying how and why bees honeycombs are hexagonally structured. I used the cube in the 16th dimension as my inspiration for inventing the first internet and inventing it with a one-to-one -one correspondence between its two raised to power 16 processors or its 64 binary thousand computers and the 65,536 vertices of the cube in the 16th dimension. Also, I used the geometrical object called the truncated icosahedron as my design inspiration for inventing a never-before-seen global network of processors that is a new internet. I constructively reduced that new internet to practice and to a new supercomputer that has a one-to-one -one correspondence between its email wires and the as many bidirectional edges of that truncated icosahedron. I named that new internet that gave rise to a never-before-seen supercomputer, a cosmic supercomputer. The technology is also called the Philip M. Aguale Internet and the Philip M. Aguale Supercomputer. To invent a second internet, I used the cube in the 16th dimension called the hypercube as my design inspiration. I used the hypercube to invent a new internet that is a never-before-understood global network of processors. That new internet outlined and defined a hyperbole supercomputer that has a one-to-one -one correspondence between its 16 times 2 raised to power 16 
bidirectional email wires or it's one binary million email wires and the one million four hundred one million forty eight thousand five hundred and seventy six bidirectional edges of the cube in the sixteenth dimension. My geometrical clarity that emanated from both the truncated icosahedron and the hypercube made the two new internets that I invented both visible and concrete. My geometrical clarity allowed my contributions to the development of the most massively parallel processing supercomputer that is the fastest computer of today or the modern supercomputer to stand out on their own. New inventions yield new words and newer languages. The word supercomputer was first used in 1967. The word internet was not in the daily times of Nigeria. That was the newspaper that I read while growing up in the early 1970s in Onitsha, East Central State, Nigeria. New inventions yield new illustrations. Therefore, the new Philip Emma Aguale Internet or the Philip Emma Aguale Cosmic Supercomputer must yield a never-before-seen illustration of that new internet and that new supercomputer. The illustrations of my hyperbole global network of processors were beautiful. They were widely copied without giving credit to Philip Emma Aguale. You've seen illustrations that were inspired by the Philip Emma Aguale internet and seen them on magazines or television or in school rooms. But you didn't realize that Philip Emma Aguale first illustrated them for his new internet. The earliest illustrations of my small copy of the internet that was camouflaged by 64 binary thousand processors became like a wild horse that belongs to any horse rider that finds it. But like a wild horse, the new supercomputer that I illustrated was difficult to ride. It's mistakenly believed that serendipity or luck must always play a role in making a scientific discovery or in making a technological invention. There's nothing serendipitous about my experimental discovery that occurred on the 4th of July of 1989 of how and why the massively parallel processing supercomputer could be used to execute the fastest floating point arithmetical computations and record that fastest calculations across an ensemble of millions of process millions upon millions of commodity off the shelf processors that are identical to each other and that were equal distances are far and apart from each other. Prior to my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing that occurred on the 4th of July of 1989, the central debate of supercomputing was that supercomputer scientists accepted Anders' law limit that limited the maximum speed up to a factor of 8 that I could attain across my global network of 64 binary thousand commodity processors. Supercomputer scientists accepted Anders' law, Anders' 
hypothesis, hypothesized but untrue maximum speed up. That acceptance meant that I was attempting to do the impossible and to attain a linear speed up and to do so across my global network of 64 binary thousand commodity processors that computed in parallel or solved 64 binary thousand computational physics problems at once. The supercomputing community uncritically accepted Amdahl's law and accepted it without demanding for the evidence that it is true or that it is even a law. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, my mathematical journey to the abstract unknown world of the partial differential equation of modern mathematics began from the embers that is a small piece of burning charcoal of the 30 month long Nigeria Biafra Civil War. My journey was from the war front to the science front. My technological quest for the then unknown massively parallel supercomputer that can be used as an instrument of physics and used for solving 64 binary thousand computational physics problems and used for solving them at once ended with 64 binary thousand startling voices in Silicon Valley, California. My experimental discovery of parallel processing had to be preceded by my theoretical discovery of parallel processing. My experimental discovery of the precursor to the modern supercomputer was the end product of my mixture of abstract calculus and advanced algebra and fastest parallel processing, supercomputing. The experimental discoverer of parallel processing must be a triple threat that is simultaneously at the frontier of knowledge in computational physics, at the frontier of knowledge in computational mathematics, and at the frontier of knowledge in massively parallel processing supercomputing. That discoverer must possess both the intellect and the knowledge, as well as the financial resources needed to acquire the most expensive supercomputer in the world. The fastest supercomputer cost the budget of a small nation. With that price tag, I cannot log into the fastest supercomputer by serendipity or luck. As an extreme scale computational physicist, I had to know what I was doing to be the sole programmer of the fastest supercomputer of the 1980s. As a large scale computational mathematician, I had to know what I was doing on each of the 16 supercomputers that I programmed alone in the 16 years onward of June 20, 1974. Why was a young black and African supercomputer scientist given charge of 16 massively parallel processing supercomputers? The reason was this. In the 1970s and 80s, vector processing supercomputers that then cost $40 million each were reserved for only white supercomputer scientists. At that time, 
the parallel processing supercomputer was abandoned, dismissed, and mocked as a waste of everybody's time. In the 1980s, I alone was logged into 16 massively parallel processing supercomputers. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, and on the 4th of July of 1989, there was no accidental discovery of massively parallel processing. The reason was that I executed the most computation-intensive floating-point arithmetical calculations and calculated how to solve a grand challenge problem in extreme-scale computational physics and solve it at the fastest recorded speed. How I accomplished that fastest speed is too detailed to be described in one hour and requires at least a hundred one-hour lecture series. Given a full-breadth lecture series on how I experimentally discovered massively parallel processing and discovered it across a global network of processors that is a new internet it's almost like giving a lecture series titled The Complete History of the Universe. The high points of my quest for how and why parallel processing makes modern computers faster and makes modern supercomputers fastest include my discovery of how to solve the most large-scale system of linear equations of algebra that occurs in petroleum reservoir modeling of the flow of oil and gas within oil fields. The high points of my quest for what makes massively parallel processing supercomputers fastest include my discovery that I could solve the most abstract system of coupled, nonlinear, and time-dependent partial differential equations of modern Cal mathematics called Emma Gualis equations. The reputation of these equations earned them a place of honor in the list of 20 grand challenge problems that are computational test beds for all supercomputers. In the 1980s, these grand challenge problems were impossible to massively parallel process across 64 binary thousand processors. Each processor had its own operating system and memory. It was also considered impossible to massively parallel process across 64 binary thousand computers that enshrouded a globe and encircled it as a global network of computers that are identical to each other and that we are equal distances are far and apart from each other. Looking back in 1946, the fastest computer in the world computed with only one scalar processing unit. In 1988, the fastest computer in the world still computed with only one vector processing unit. Shortly after my experimental discovery of the 4th of July of 1989, it made the news headlines that an African supercomputer wizard in the United States of America had experimentally discovered how the most massively parallel processing supercomputer ever built can massively parallel compute and compute with 65,536 commodity processors and solve 65,536 computational physics 
problems simultaneously. I am that African supercomputer scientist that was in the news in 1989. My discovery opened the door to the new world of fastest supercomputing where the large-scale computational physicists can massively parallel process across 10 binary million commodity processors. After a 10 binary million fold increase in the speed of computation, it's not unreasonable to expect another 100 fold increase that could enable the fastest supercomputer of tomorrow to massively parallel process and to do so across one binary billion commodity processors that each had its own operating system and memory. Or to do so across one binary billion identical computers on the internet of maybe the 22nd century. That experimental discovery of parallel processing or parallel computing many initial boundary value problems of calculus and physics and solving them at once instead of solving, instead of sequentially solving one computation, computational problem at a time is the answer to the often asked question, quote unquote. What did Philip M. Aguale contribute to the development of the computer? I was asked, is there beauty in the mathematics used to theoretically discover parallel processing? If so, did that beauty help you to experimentally discover parallel processing. My set of floating point arithmetical operations is detailed and its beauty is visible only to the arithmetician. My system of equations of a new algebra is abstract and its beauty is visible only to the algebraist. My system of coupled nonlinear and time dependent partial differential equations of a new calculus was used to define some of the grand challenges of computational physics, and its beauty is visible only to the grand wizards of calculus. My geometrical illustrations were described as beautiful because the beauty of a geometrical object is self-evident. What attracted eyeballs to my experimental discovery of parallel processing across my new hyperball supercomputer was my 1970s geometrical illustrations of the parts that I parallel processed my emails through. Unlike a system of coupled, nonlinear, and time dependent partial differential equations of modern mathematics that's abstract, invincible, and very ugly, my geometrical illustrations of my new hyperball and new cosmic supercomputers. We are concrete, visible, and very beautiful. It's beautiful to look at the bidirectional edges, to look at the one-to-one -one correspondence to the as many email wires that interconnected 64 binary thousand vertices and did so with a one-to-one -one correspondence to 64 binary thousand commodity processors or to 64 binary thousand identical computers. 
I might add that the beauty in mathematics differs from the beauty in music or in a novel. A song and a story entertain. However, my mathematical equation or my computer algorithm is functional at the low level and intellectual at the abstract level. Before my experimental discovery that occurred on the 4th of July of 1989, the leaders of thought in the world of supercomputing ridiculed parallel processing as a beautiful theory that lacked experimental confirmation. Parallel processing is beautiful if and only if it parallel processed perfectly and became the driving force behind all computers and the fastest supercomputers. Thank you very much. Dalono Afam Buchukura Philip Emma Agwale Abum Onyo Onicha Biagafum na Emma Agwale dot com Comesia I'm Philip Emma Agwale at Emma Agwale dot com Thank you very much Thank you Thank you Insightful and brilliant picture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.